Hello and welcome to the Liverpool Connection podcast. I'm Daz, I've got Steve with me as always and uh, today's guest, um, I'm not going to say his name yet, um, but he's someone that I listened to uh, musically uh, growing up in my teenage years in Formby um, and my mum used to bang on the ceiling uh, to turn, turn the music down. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, by, by the end of my teenage years, uh, my mum knew every word of, uh, of the album. Um, he's also the founding member of The End Fanzine, um, also a author of the book, uh, The Boot Bloom Boys, and uh, he's part of the committee for Spirit of Shankly. It is Mr. Peter Hooten. Hello. How are you? Yeah, please <laughs> be the wonders of modern technology. I know, it's crazy, but... That, I understood you know, every word you said. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, you know, this is how it's going to be for a while, is, you know, doing the Zoom thing. This is how I talk to my family. Yeah, exactly. Living in the same house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to delve into it. Um, I've got uh, kind of two, two questions to begin with. Um, yeah. What what uh, does Liverpool Football Club mean to you? And then, what was your first like Anfield experience? Yeah, um, to me, Liverpool Football Club it's 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 in my blood really. My grand my granddad was uh, born uh, opposite basically uh, the cop, you know. Uh, he lived in Anfield, so my very first memories were of going to my nans and and seeing the ground, you know. They were my very first memories. Um, so I think it's a family tradition, you know, so it's, my granddad was born in um, 1880s. So when Liverpool were established in 1892, he became a fan straight away. I don't know whether he supported the other team, the, you know, the foundation was uh, St. Domingo, which then went on to become Everton. So I don't know the history, but he was certainly always a Liverpool fan from from what I know that you know he was going to the match from the start you know and um, and he was also um, a footballer and I've got photographs of him from 1906-1907 season oh, wow. winning the uh, Anfield and Kensington Cup you know uh, an old uh, CPF type photograph so my earliest memories were of, of Liverpool and my dad lived obviously um, uh, they moved from Grampton Road, which was opposite the cop, a bit further along, if anyone knows Anfield, just fit about 200 yards down Oakfield Road towards Breck Road. Uh, and they lived on a street called Hay Street. So I used to go to my nan's on a Saturday, then walk to the end of the street to meet my dad coming back from the match. Because from 62, he was a season ticket holder in um, at Anfield. When they built the new Cannon Road, which became the St. Emery stand is now the Kenny Dagley stand. He had a season ticket from the very first uh, season it was open. So my earliest memories was like four and five. We'll go to the end of the street. It never allow it nowadays, but I'd go to the end of the street and go, go past, you know, go against the flow of people coming from the ground till I saw my dad and then we walk home together, you know. So they were the earliest memories, you know, and then... Uh, I think my granddad took me to the first match, but it was a reserve game. And I remember it because uh, if you got a season ticket in those days, they played the reserves played at Anfield when the first team were away. So you'd get in to the ground for a reserve game with your season ticket and you didn't have to pay. You know, it was just a, a, um, an added bonus, you know. So I remember being at this ground where there was no one there, hardly, you know. And, just remember sitting on a crash barrier. And the reason I remember it is because I fell off the barrier and split my head open, you know, so it was a painful. My first experience of Anfield was pretty painful. I don't think I had stitches, but I had a bad cut on my head, you know. Um, so that was my first recollection. Um, uh, but my dad then started taking me. He was, he was the mate of a fella called um, Ray Shelley. And Ray Shelley's dad had been the trainer in the 40s and 50s. His name was Albert Shelley. Uh, but even in the 60s, Albert Shelley was one of those people who was part of the club. So even though he wasn't getting paid anymore, he was retired, he'd still go in and fix the boots, you know, and, and just do odd jobs, painting or whatever. But 
Shankly loved him, you see. So even though he wasn't on the payroll anymore, they still let him come in, you know, and uh, he was the odd job man, you know. So we get tickets. Um, and I always remember the tickets were in the obstructed view at the main stand. And I don't know if anyone remembers. The obstructed view was right next to the cop, but also right next to the boy's pen. So we were sitting in the obstructed view and there'd be no one around. In those days, there wasn't, every game wasn't sold out. You know, it was like an obstructed view. You'd be, it'd only be you and no one else really, you know, because you, you had a stanchion in front of you. But they're the tickets we got. So I always remember first games. And my dad said he took me to uh, Newcastle, Liverpool, Newcastle, where Tony Hayley scored a hat trick. Mm -hmm. And also where Gary Sprake threw into his own net. But I can't really remember the games, you know, when I was, I was a youngster. So I, but all I remember from that period was being fascinated with the cop. So I'd look to the side and you'd hear, this, you'd hear the, uh, the songs coming and I was thinking one day I'll be big enough to go in there, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, for, what, what, what does the club mean to you, you know, on an everyday basis? Well, I think um, uh, you know it's it's part it's, it's part of the fabric of my life, really. You know, I think if someone was to say when I was a kid, "What do you want to be, a footballer or a music or in a band?" I would have said footballer every time. You know, it's interesting that you, sometimes you meet foot players now, and they have the opposite. They'd rather be in pop music or whatever. You know, I think they're mad. You know, I think obviously <laughs> playing football, and I always remember from an early age. That's all I ever wanted to do, play football. And so I'd be out. Um, I lived by, um, I was brought up by AC Racecourse, which is a famous race course in the UK, which has the Grand National, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I wasn't particularly interested in horse racing, but I was just interested in every, every time I had the chance, I'd go to the park and play football, morning, noon and night, you know. And it wasn't really organised in those days. You know, now kids have got, uh, samba goals and, and uh, referees and playing from from seven years old in organised games. Ours were just mass kickabouts and that's what I loved about them. And I think that's where no one was coaching you. There was no one saying, don't do this, don't do that. It was all natural ability. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think a certain amount of that's been lost from the game, you know, but if it's the same, what, the, what football means to me is, you know, it's it's everything, but not Liverpool Football Club. It's uh, you know, it's it is my life. You know, it's like um, I'm just obsessed with it. You know, and even it's like a drug, really. I think you try and you know you try and get away from it, but it always it always uh, drags you back. The only time I haven't been to Anfield really since the seventies was during the uh, the Graham Sooners period when he he um, did the interview with the Sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and I decided that I wasn't going to go until not had anything particularly against Sooners because as a player he was one of my favourite ever players mm -hmm. but I just thought symbolically you can't do that and be Liverpool's manager so I, I, I stopped going the game I boycotted the game you know but that's the only time I've ever stopped going really obviously when I was on tour in the early 90s we toured Europe and the States so I'd miss uh, some games but our tours tended to be it from May to September, and there was usually a reason for that, you know, and that was because that's what we wanted. We wanted there was three Liverpoolians in the band, and one Evertonian, which I think, I think even realistically, even Evertonians would admit that's probably the ratio for for our generation, you know, uh, but for youngsters, it's it's probably even more now, you know. Um. And also want to um, uh, talk talk about um, get a bit of background on on the fanzine and um, how how that started. Yeah, well, the, um, there was one of my mates did a there was a thing called mod, the mod revival, just after punk. On seventy nine, there was a film called Quadrophenia, which you might or might not know about. Um, but it was, it was about uh, mods and rockers. And it was in the 60s, if you ever look at footage, you know, there was two tribes and it was 
one were mods who were like uh, working class dressed up and the others were rockers leather jackets the mods all had scooters and all dressed in italian suits and they looked to me the sharpest you know the rockers uh, i don't know what it what it was about rockers but even when i was a kid i didn't like you know that style you know i, I was always attracted to the mod image so this lad did um, a mod fanzine called time for action uh, about this mod revival so that was about 79 80. so he was only 17 at the time it's like phil jones his name was so i thought if he can do that why can't we do one i keep on seeing people who go to football matches but let's keep on seeing them at concerts as well whether it was the, the specials, the beats, the jam, the clash, you know, all groups like that. So I'd see the same people. I think there must be a, because in those days it was either, if you had a fanzine, it was all about music. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to incorporate music and football. And a lot of people tried to put me off, said, I oh, don't get people from the match by it. Nah, you know, they're not interested, you know, but I wanted it to be funny, but to never have a joke in it. If you know what I mean, because yeah. at, at the time uh, people sold student rag mags on the street, which were full of like jokes and that, and people used to find them hilarious. But I didn't, because you know I didn't find the jokes funny. And most th things I found funny were observational humour. You know, and I wanted it to be off, off the wall, really. You know, so uh, almost Monty Pythonish. You know, of like so things that were bizarre. So we just. When we started the fanzine, it was a deliberate attempt to target people who were interested in music, but also had an interest in football and fashion. Uh, and it was targeted not just at Liverpool fans, it was targeted at Everton fans as well. So we used to sell it at both grounds, you know, and it became, um, it became very successful, but only in an underground way. We could never have had it published uh, by a proper publisher because they would have been sued straight away because every every sacred cow the uh, the liverpool as a city uh, held in in all we attacked you know we just attacked everything uh, and a few people got upset by it but we'd never we don't we'd attack like local djs and local personalities and all that type of thing but you know it was like it was a very punk ethic really it was year zero as far as we were concerned and People started then writing in about uh, what clothes do you wear at the match, and we used to have letters, and we just dismissed them, and we just ridiculed everyone. And it was like um, people probably thought, "Who the hell are these to ridicule?" But I remember John Peel said, uh, "I wrote to him, and I wrote to him a pretty uh, it wasn't an obnoxious letter, but it was I thought it was witty, just telling him where he was going wrong with his musical tastes, <laughs> you know." Which is like for someone who's Teenagers to be doing that. John Pierre read it and went, who the hell are these guys? It's like that, um, it's like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where they're getting pursued by the detectives and they go, who are these guys? You know, uh, over the ridge, you know, who are they? You know, we, we should have lost them by now. And people had that same reaction, who the hell are these three attacking, you know, uh, us left, right and centre. But Peel said, that, uh, it was exactly the type of letter that made him want to meet us because he thought, I want to, I want to, he said he wants to knock around with us. <laughs> so we actually met him and that's when it became, it was in the New Musical Express, which was a, a well-read music weekly. But also when Peel started uh, promoting it, it just went nationwide, you know. So then we had all sorts of different foot fans from other teams saying, we wear this, we wear that, you know, but we, in the letters column, we just ridiculed them, you know, so whatever they wore, and it wasn't us saying we were fashionable, we had an ins and outs column, so even things that were fashionable in Liverpool would be immediately in the outs column, mm -hmm. just to cause mass confusion. <laughs> it's a bit like politics in America now. <laughs> it's everything's done to cause mass confusion, you know, so, but people liked it and they, you could see people in pubs before and after the game, reading it and laughing and that. But, you know, I'm pretty proud that um, there was never one joke in it. And there wasn't, there was never really a stereotype in it. There might have been a few, but there was never, we were tired to, you know, we obviously, we were anti-racist, anti-sexist, but the people will find things in there, go, oh, look at that, that, you know, so it might, there might have, some things might have slipped through, but 
I think genuinely we were trying to be a you know radical alternative to the stereotypes. You know, we had even had uh, we predicted only as a joke, but in the mid eighties, Liverpool was high unemployment. Thatcher was in government. Um, the docks were on the decline because of containerisation. So Liverpool was a bit of a post-industrial waste ground. But we had a, one of the characters in it was Joe Wag. It was supposed to be like a, a really streetwise scallywag who, who you know, knew what to do on the street. And he was predicting in his manifesto that Liverpool would become a tourist city. Uh, but what he meant was it would become the new Amsterdam. And there was a reference, to, obviously, there to people. It was everywhere you went in Liverpool in them days. Mm -hmm. People were smoking pot everywhere you went. It was people were listening to Genesis, Pink Floyd, Simon and Garfunkel. You know, it become a really even though they were these were people from the council estates, from the working class. They weren't hippies as such, but they took over that mantra of you know, hey, you know. Unfortunately, that led to um, in the eighties to uh, heroin epidemics in the city, which I think was the you know it, it really did damaged um, the youth of the city. Yeah, um, well, especially like the glue sniffing as well. I, I remember all that. It was bad, bad time. Um, but uh, w with the fanzine, I, I love how you, you uh, describe the doorstep interviews. Uh, yeah. Where, where yeah. you would just show up at their place. Yeah, yeah. Well, we just thought... We took it like we took it from. Uh, I went to see the clash. Went to the. I went to the nineteen eighty one European Cup final against Real Madrid, Liverpool, and I was with a load of my mates and that. And we didn't go and see anything in Paris. You know, all we were doing was looking for like good bars or sports shops that had stuff that we couldn't get in England. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to go to the Palace of Versailles. You know, I wanted to go to the Louvre. I wanted to go to a few places. So decided to go back in the September. So the match was in May. And a few months later, we decided, we went back to the same hotel by the um, San Lazar station in, in uh, Paris. Same hotel. And then I read in the enemy, the Clash were playing. So I thought, I'll go and find out where, the old, where, the, where they're playing. Thinking, well, it might be five miles across the city or 10 miles. I, I was still going to go. And when I got to Paris, it was round the corner. It was just unbelievable. It was literally a, a five-minute walk to the Mogador Theatre where the Clash were on for seven nights. And they were playing with the, the Beat, who were an English, like, Scottish, reggae band. And also a fella called Pete Wiley from Liverpool. Um, so I thought, uh, I'll go down during the soundcheck time just to suss it out and see if I can see anyone that I knew, you know. Anyway, I get to the stage door. And no one's stopping me. I can hear the clash sound check. Uh, and this fella, as I walk in, he went, Are you with Pete Wiley? And I said, Are you from Liverpool? <laughs> he went, Yeah. He said, I'm the, I'm the clash's tour manager. I said, Oh, I'm from Liverpool as well. He said, Who do you support? <laughs> I said, Liverpool. He said, Are you coming tonight? I said, Well, if I get a ticket, yeah. He said, I'll get you a pass. So he gave me a pass. And then I was in. <laughs> so, so for seven nights, and it was a bit of a catalyst, really. Everybody thought I was with Pete Wiley. Everyone thought I was part of his entourage, you know, but I wasn't. I don't think I knew him. Um, and when I was, um, so I, I went to see the class six out of seven nights. Wow. I wanted a night off just so I could uh, look forward to the next night, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. instead of just doing the seven straight ones. And it was during the Sandinista period, and they had a graffiti artist called Futura who, as they were playing, he would be doing graffiti behind them, like a mural, and it was absolutely brilliant. You know, and the Clash were like, they were, they were my, you know, years ahead at the time. You know, they were incorporating hip-hop beats. If you listen to the Magnificent Seven and tracks like that, it was, you know, they were using hip-hop beats, you know, years before uh, Acid House, really, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was fantastic, but I became part of the Clash family almost. Um, and I took photographs backstage. In a way, that was another catalyst for the end because I thought, I've got all these photographs. I pretended that I did an interview with them. All I did was I listened to this French radio who was interviewing Strummer and Mick Jones and just jotted down a few notes about the, how they danced, you know. 
So uh, that became another reason why I've got this photographs of them and a bit of an interview. Yeah, I've got to get something out. So that was another catalyst for the end. But, so that was, I think, in addition number two. But when we were in Paris, um, I was in the dressing room one night uh, at the Clash and we weren't there. But, you know, it was before the farm existed. So we weren't used to things, but they had a table full of fruit and veg, and, you know, and sandwiches, nail, and everything, beer. You know, it was one of those things where you, it was just like you were staring at it. <laughs> looking at it for ages, you know, going, that's unbelievable. Anyway, I got it, I took a banana, thinking, oh, I'll help myself to a banana. And as I was eating, um, you know, I was peeling the banana, Stormer and Mick Jones walked in with the guitars on the back, and they went, uh, and I was sorry about this, boys, said, uh, I was starving on that. And he went, we're the clash, you take what you want. <laughs> and I just thought, what a brilliant, you know, that, it wasn't a front, Mm -hmm. Everything he said, everything he did, uh, and on the last night, it's a brilliant story that uh, the last night, uh, after, after the last night, they wanted to go to a nightclub in Paris, so they had all these Parisian punks with them. They were like the uh, Mick Jones and Joe Summer, like the Pied Pipers, walking around the streets of Paris looking for a club that had let them in, and they'd had a few recommendations, but they had forty to 50 punks with them, or wastrels from Paris, you know, and me, and a few others. You know. And we were all walking along, and every club they went to, they, uh, they'd say, can we get all these people in with us? These are all our friends. No, no, the clash can come in and all. And he, we went to all five clubs until they let everyone in. That's what they were like. And I thought, if you're going to be in a band, be in a band like that, mm -hmm. you know, a people's band. And that's what they were, you know. We were, it was incredible stuff, you know. Well, well, I know the class were very anti-establishment, you know, uh, and the, the ethos of, of, you know, against Thatcherism. Um, yeah. it, and it, with, the, with the farm, um, like your first album, Spartacus, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, ba basically. Yeah. Um, so what, what was your mindset? Like, we, we, we you you know, thinking a bit about the clash uh, with, with your song structures and your lyrics. Yeah. Well, originally when we started, um, we were doing a lot of John Peel sessions and that's where we got recorded. And that actually came out as Patches Old and New before Spartans, but it wasn't really our release. It was a company that we'd signed some mad deal with. Uh, you know, one of those deals where they offered you 800 pound for your songs forever or something, you know. We got out a bit later on. But it wasn't really our album. We never, we never really put our. They were basically BBC recording sessions, you know. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be. I wanted the amalgamation of, of the Clash and the Specials, and so it was a bit uh, Scar influenced as well, you know. Seeing the way, similar to the way that the uh, the Clash did Police and Thieves, mm -hmm. which was obviously a, a, a record from Jamaica. Uh, and they copied it, you know, so it was all that type of element, you know. But about 86, I went to see Big Audio Dynamite, who were Mick Jones's new band, you know. Because famously, he got sacked by The Clash, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Even though it was, he was one of the founder members, you know. But, um, but, you know, that was a traumatic period. But when Big Audio started, they had Don Letts with them, and they were using hip-hop beats, and they, were, and they were like, it was a continuation of Magnificent Seven, really, you know. I think someone was more rock and roll. I think Mick Jones was open to new ideas, you know, of, uh, of dance music, really, you know. And we went to see Big Audio Dynamite in Liverpool, a place called The State. Uh, and I just heard that it was all samples from Spaghetti Westerns. And uh, it was absolutely blew me mind, you know, and they were using samples in 86, you know. And I thought, that's what I want the farm to be, you know, to be emulating that, you know. But we couldn't afford a sampler at the time. Samplers were like a few thousand dollars, you know. You couldn't afford them at the time. We couldn't anyway. Uh, so it took us a couple of years before we could actually get the money together to buy them. Uh, buy, and they'd be like, now anyone can sample off probably an iPhone or whatever, you know. But in, in those days, to take a sample off a record, you know, it was a complicated business. You had to, you had to have someone who knew what they were doing, you know. Um, always remember we played in 
1991 with Big Audio, we did a tour of the States. And we also had another group on with us called Downtown Science, who were a New York hip hop band, you know, but the, one, of the, one of the rhythm masters from Downtown Science was a lad called Sam Seavers, you know, or Sam Seaver. And he'd be, he produced loops for all sorts of different groups, but one in particular, Third Bass, who were a New York mm -hmm. uh, hip hop, and they were fantastic. And we'd used a few of their samples, you know, from the drum loops. And that. So when we were doing a sound check one day, I think it might have been in Houston, actually. I think I remember it was somewhere in Texas, I'm sure it was. Like, and um, Sam was listening to our sound check, and he comes up, and I'm, I'm by the microphone, and I recognise a few of them beats. <laughs> and we knew what was called. We thought, oh, no, here's the lawyer's phone number. Like, but, uh, he went, uh, Oh, I'm flattered that you're using them, man. You know, I'm flattered. You know, thanks a lot for using them. And I said, well, how much do we owe you? And he went, no, forget <laughs> it. You know, it was, it was the class style, you know. Uh, we just, you know, because they weren't, it wasn't like um, drum beats were different. Enough. Obviously, it wasn't part of a song. It wasn't a, a guitar riff or, or you know, or a, or a melody. It was, it was drum loops. And obviously, he'd got drum loops from other places as well himself, you know, so... That was all part of the game, you know. Yeah, you could you couldn't probably pull that one off today without the lawyers. <laughs> no chance. They they they'd be knocking down your door. Yeah, I'm sure they would. Well, someone did get in touch. A group called Maltronics got in touch with, touch with us. And he was, I think he was originally from New York, and he'd seen an advert in the UK, but he was living in the UK then, and he saw this uh, advert, and it was for Stepping Stone. We'd used the drum loop. Uh, and it was from, he said, this is, you've used my drum loop, Maltronics and that. And so uh, one of the group, one of my mates went on a hip hop uh, fan board in America, in New York, and said, do anyone know where Maltronics got their drum loop from for this particular track that he was saying we were using? And he waited months and months and someone came back uh, with, the, with the track he got it from, which was a 70s, a 70s track. So when our lawyer just said to him, well, you know, fair enough, we've used that, but uh, we'll have to inform the lawyer of this artist that you used it and we never heard from him again. You know? <laughs> that's, that's the way to do it. Um, All Together Now, you know, is, a, is an anthem. Uh, uh, I, I want to know, like, the, the lyrics behind it and what, what, what they actually mean to you. Yeah, it was... Um... It was something that I'd always wanted to tell people about, uh, about this incident that happened in the uh, First World War, when on Christmas Day in 1914, uh, British and German troops stopped fighting and basically met, fraternised in no man's land. So it was like, it, for me, it was to be, uh, I wanted to publicise that event, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now, we had a song called No Man's Land and the, some of the verses came all together now, you know, but we didn't have a chorus, proper, a proper chorus, but when dance music came along and we started incorporating drum loops and various things, it slowed the track down. And because we were going to Ibiza and to all these raves everywhere, you know, I, it just came to me one day in a rehearsal all together now, you know, in No Man's Land, it was just like, I think I was singing something else at the time, but then that came to me and I, it was just perfect. Our guitarist had always said, I think you should put <clears throat> the lyrics of No Man's Land to Packer Bell's Cannon. He called it the wool advert because in the UK, Packer Bell's Cannon had been used for lots, and diff lots of different things, but it was particularly uh, a wool advert advertising British wool, believe it or not. Uh, buy British wool, you know. Um, and he remembered that as a kid, the advert. So he said, I think it would really work with, uh, with the lyrics to No Man's Land. And so we tried it one day and it fitted perfectly, you know. But I was trying to get across to people that, you know, all the uh, jingoism and nationalism of what went on in the First World War. There was another side to the war. There was a human face to the war, you know. There was a different... Uh, people have been told... Um, the war will be over by Christmas, you know. I think there's some brilliant books on the First World War, but I still think in, in Britain in particular, uh, there's still this 
idea that it was this glorious war in the trenches and you know horrific but had to be fought you know and really if you really analyze it uh, europe um, they slept walked into that war there was no real reason for it and the only reason you can get that down the basics is that it, uh, the british empire was feeling threatened by german industrialism and that's what it that's what it boils down to you know that they thought the Germans want a navy. They shouldn't have a navy. We've got the navy. You know, it's all that Britain rule the way. Britain rules the way. It's real Britannia nonsense, you know. But because we're coming into a, a mechanicalized age, a mechanized age, you had a warfare that was based upon the 19th century. That's what the British Army wanted: cavalry charges, and you know, um, and they were dealing with machine guns, you know. So I wanted to tell the human face, but also the fact that the people fighting on the German side and the British side, and eventually the Americans when they joined the war, were exactly the same. You know, they were the working class of the country who's fighting for the, uh, for imperialism really, you know, and I think, um, I think the song means certain things to certain people, but I meant it as a peace song. And I wrote the lyrics uh, probably in a period after John Lennon got shot, because that's the first time I started writing. I was so upset when uh, John Lennon got murdered, you know, I was like, I was the whole, the whole world was, but I think in Liverpool, we felt as if, you know, he was our, he was our brother, you know, that's what we felt like, he was ours, you know, and, and he campaigned for peace, and, and it really affected me. Um, so I started writing my thoughts down on paper, which were probably early songs, but they were just thoughts, really, you know. And uh, during that period, I read about this truce um, that wasn't really publicised when you went to when you studied the war, you know, at school. It wasn't really publicised, you know, because it's it's the one thing the, um, uh, the people who uh, who write about war and who write about you know the victors write write the books, don't they? They didn't want you really to know about it because it was a uh, oh we don't talk about that you know that was when they fraternised with each other you know and the leader of um, there was someone who started the Labour Party in in uh, the UK Keir Hardy when he found out about the truce in 1914 he thought that was the beginning of the workers revolting you know both sides against the generals you know because the generals and some brilliant books uh, about the First World War, and if you really read into it, the generals were from a certain elite class, um, and they basically treated the troops as cannon fodder. I mean, there's no doubt about that, you know, and I think they, were, they felt as if they were fighting a war like they'd have fought in Africa against, um, you know, unarmed people, uh, where they could just do what they wanted and the cavalry at charge. And then they were fighting, um, and, you know, a very sophisticated um, army with modern weapons, but they were still fighting as if it was the American Civil War or something, you know, with, um, the, you know, it was, it was just a ridiculous, a ridiculous uh, way to fight, you know. And if you look at, um, there's a book by Adam Hothschild, uh, called to end all wars, and if you read that, it opens up. It opens up. You know, um, the real truth about what went on and the class divisions within the in the army. You know, and there's uh, General Haig, who was regarded as the butcher of the Somme on the British side. He was from Sandhurst. That was the uh, cavalry, you know, uh, um, um, academy, uh, and basically. All he wanted was the, the troops to go over the top, to wipe out the German defences and then the cavalry to charge and take all the glory. That was what it was based on. It was absolutely ridiculous. So I think that element of humanity during that 1914 truce, that should be the thing celebrated about the First World War. Not the death and destruction. I think it should be elements of you know, human nature because people started fraternizing, people started talking to each other, people swapping photographs, swapping presents. 
And there's some brilliant uh, first-hand descriptions of, you know, the people meeting each other in the trenches and that. And along the front, it was a 500-mile front. It, there wasn't a truce everywhere, but along great advances of the way, you know. And, uh, and sit, you know, there's at least three or four recorded football matches, you know, mm -hmm. of mass just getting the ball out and playing and that. So I just think, as a as symbolism, it's absolutely brilliant. You know? So that's what I wanted the the song to represent. In fact, in America, it was I think Groovy Train came out first in the states. Groovy Train got to number forty one on the Billboard. It was on heavy rotation on MTV. It was uh, number one on the modern rock charts and it was doing really well, you know. But then they tried to re-release all together now. But it had been the other way around in England. It had been in the UK. It had been Step and Stone, Groovy Train, all together now. But in America, it had been, um, uh, you know, we all together now being released on import, really. So uh, that had done that had done the rounds of the radio station. Then it was Groovy Train. Which was nearly a hit. Then the American record company tried to re-release altogether, so it didn't really work properly. But I still look at the stats, you know. And we still got a few listeners on Spotify in the in the states, you know. It's probably but, me. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's probably me. <laughs> yeah, Texas is a big area for us. I I still have it, the it gives, you, it gives you the it gives you the different cities as well, you know. Yeah, I think I still have the cassette. Oh, the cassette, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a cat, yeah. That, that's a that's a museum piece now, you know. Yeah, it is. It goes with me, me trainers as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I can see them all in the background there. I'll yeah. just have a look at the because you've got something obviously Spotify for artists. So if you if they can establish it in the group, they'll give you all the stats. And you mm -hmm. know, uh, I'm just looking on the phone here with with Texas. Uh, if it comes up, uh, it's taking a bit of a time to load, but yeah, you can you can see which cities are listening to the, um, and which which areas. I think you know, the UK is obviously our best, you know. But uh, oh, it's logged me out, so I can't can't get into it at the moment. Well, it was so. great great back then, anyway, because you were, you know uh, I know the farm uh, you you lads got remixed. A bunch of times, you know, so that kind of helped put put you on on the map too. On on you know, like the acid house scene as well, which yeah. m must have been cool. But uh, yeah, to be put in the uh, modern rock category in America, that's yeah. that's quite funny. Well, that was most indie bands were, weren't they? Yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> and modern rock stations are still going, presumably. Uh, I mean, we thought. We thought the modern rock stations were absolutely fantastic, you know, absolutely brilliant. And I think the equivalent to it in the UK is Radio Six now, which will play new stuff. And, and but you know, thought the modern rock stations were absolutely brilliant in the states, you know. Um, Steve, I I'm, I'm going to bring Steve on now because I think I, with, Hi, I've, I've been talking too much. I know Steve's got a bunch of questions for. Oh me. yeah, I always have questions. But Peter, uh, first of all, thanks for coming on. It's you know, it's been a pleasure just um, learning more about your music you know admittedly I don't know a lot about the music and and yeah. so it's been enlightening to hear about it but one of the fascinating things that that I'm learning through this conversation so far is that you've always been a storyteller through your music um, you want to tell stories you, um, obviously you're very interested in history you know a lot of the things yeah, you yeah. Reference, yeah. Uh, a lot of things you referenced about World War One and that that episode you know I've read as well so it kind of is is evident that you've always had this uh capability to to write and put your things down on on paper um you know you've had a just as successful career as a, a writer as you have has at a musician you know writing for 442 the the fanzine and you know being contributor to uh, uh or and collaborators for other books yeah. so um i wanted to bring it kind of forward to the the boot room boys yeah. Um, it seems that uh, I know it was it was published in 2019, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. So it seems yeah, it's like just the, the end of 2018, but it was okay. mainly out last year. Yeah. Right. And it seems like with, you know, we talk about technology and the ability to connect from all around the world, there's a new generation of fans and also 
um, worldwide who don't really know about Bill Shankly. You know, obviously yeah. there wasn't the TV and the yeah. radio coverage back then. But, and oh. so authors like yourself, you know, we had uh, uh, Karen on yesterday, right? Um, talking about oh, yeah. her, her grandfather. Yeah, and yeah. so can you kind of tell us what the, the decision-making process was to bring that book and uh, to life? Well, um, I'd done a book in um, 2008 mm -hmm. called When Football Was Football, right. uh, Liverpool. And it was a series of books. It starts off as a generic book, When Football Was Football, about mm -hmm. every different club. But that had been a success. So the publisher said they wanted to do uh, the next one, the next series were going to be Liverpool and Man United because he mm -hmm. thought they were the biggest teams uh, in the Premier League, you know. So he got on the phone to me and said, will you do this book? And it was mainly a photographic book, mm -hmm. mainly photographs uh, uh, from the archive. Um, and it was about the history from 1892 to 1992 of Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't because uh, Liverpool stopped winning the league then. It was simply because when the Premier League was started, they then jointly owned the rights to the photographs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Daily Mirror, which is a big publication mm -hmm. in the UK, mm -hmm. their photographs were owned by them solely until 1992. So that's how we could use them. So I did a lot of research and I wasn't sure how to go about it, but the fellow on the end of the phone um, convinced me that I could do it, you know. Um, and my name was given to them by a Man United fan, actually, called Andy Mitten who does the fanzine called United We Stand, and that's their United's main fanzine. Andy now is uh, writes for The Athletic and where he's all, still does the fanzine, but he was the one who recommended me, you see, because they just didn't want the football history. They wanted a bit of the social and economic history of the city, you know. And I've always been obsessed with history, you're right. I've always been obsessed with history. Uh, so I did the book um, when football was football Liverpool and they'd done a book for every club then after that they did Celtic, they did Rangers, Tottenham, Arsenal, Chelsea but the best selling book for the whole of it was the, the Liverpool one. Mm -hmm. Now I think that's because of Bill Shankly. Bill Shankly was photographed in the archive. Uh, I'd say Shankly photographs outnumbered Paisley photographs by five to one, easily. Mm -hmm. Every opportunity to have a photograph taken, Bill Shankly was there. So he was there with, you know, he was there with, uh, he was there with politicians, he was there with uh, pop singers, he was there with Red Rum, who was a famous racehorse. <laughs> he got his photograph taken with Red Rum. Mm -hmm. So everywhere there was a photo opportunity, Shankly was obviously going, I'll do that, because he was a, he was, like Klopp is, he was a big personality. Paisley was the opposite. Paisley shied away from the camera. Bill Shankly was attracted to it. So Liverpool was built from 1950 onwards, 59 onwards. Um, Liverpool was built uh, in Shankly's image, really. Mm -hmm. So this club that had been in the doldrums, really, in the second division, quite happy in the second division because they were still getting very good gates. They were still getting 40,000, sometimes 50,000 at Anfield in the second division, but they were always missing out on promotion to the then first division, which is now the Premier League, you know, the top division. So Shankly uh, was offered the job and he said he'd only come to Anfield if he was allowed to pick the team. Now, famously, um, Matt Busby, had been um, interested in the Liverpool job because he was one of Liverpool. He's the famous United manager. Uh, but after the war, he wanted to be the Liverpool manager. And it just shows you how history can transform things. But Liverpool board still wanted to pick the team. And Matt Busby wasn't happy with that. So he was offered a coaching role uh, at Liverpool. But he didn't want that. He wanted the manager's job, but he wanted to be able to pick the team. And so he went to United. When Shankly was offered the job in 59, he said, I'll only come if I can pick the team. So the board of directors who picked the team previously 
you know, it's just, it's, it, it seems ludicrous now that that could happen, but it, that's the way it was. Mm. So they agreed to that. And I don't think they really knew what they were getting with Bill Shankly. Bill Shankly revolutionised that club. He was a whirlwind. Everyone you've ever spoken to, anyone you've ever read stuff about is like, is, he was infectious. He always goes on about natural enthusiasm. You're nothing without natural enthusiasm, you know. Mm -hmm. And you can see he was obsessed with football, totally obsessed with football. And he wanted to take Liverpool. He was so ambitious. In the other clubs he'd been at, uh, Huddersfield he came from, and before that he'd been at places like Workington and, uh, and Carlisle and places like that. You know, they'd never, he'd never done anything really successful, even at Huddersfield. But he had that ambition. He wanted to buy players in the Huddersfield board. Kept on saying no. Kept on saying no, we can't afford them. We can't afford. Got to Liverpool. And the board started saying the same thing. He couldn't believe it. He thought, I've been, I've been sold a dud here. They, they said they were ambitious. And he wanted to buy Jack Charlton. Just recently passed away. He wanted to buy uh, various players. Dave McKay is another one. Mm -hmm. uh, and he certainly wanted to buy uh, Ron Heats and Ian St. John. And the board kept on saying, no, we can't afford it. No, we can't afford it. So he was really disillusioned, Shankly, in the early days. And he kept on phoning Matt Busby up. And Matt Busby would be telling him all the time, whatever you do, Bill, do not leave. Just stick at it. It'll, things will change. Something will happen and things will change. And what happened was, it was um, Everton elected. Um, oh, you, oh my God, something's happened. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope that's not a symbol for this season. No, I hope <laughs> but, not uh, either. <laughs> but um, what happened was, uh, there was a, uh, an entrepreneur called John Moores, who was famous for something called the Little Woods Pools. It's like the lottery, really. You filled in a pool coupon and spot the ball as well. Where, where was the ball? Where was the ball on this coupon? You know, and he became a multi multi millionaire. You know, and he started uh, a retail business. He was a bit like the Amazon of its time, you know, really. Um, even though the figures are different, but he was regarded as one of the richest men in sport. But he got elected to become the chair of Evan in '61, I think it was. Um, and when he got elected chair of Everton, he had shares in Liverpool as well. But he thought, I can't really stay on the board of Liverpool and be the chairman of Everton. Conflict of interest, fans wouldn't have allowed it, you know. So he nominated the shares to the director of finance at Littlewoods, a fellow called Eric Sawyer. Now, Eric Sawyer was the director of finance at Littlewoods. So that's like literally the director of finance at uh, Apple or Microsoft, you know. So, mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It was that. Little Woods were that big in, in uh, the UK, you know, they were absolutely massive, you know. So when Eric Sawyer joined the board, Ibn Shankly got on great. He was a new face. He was a financial expert. People had, all these local businessmen had respect, oh, he's from Little Woods, you know, he's, he knows what he's doing, you know. And he started to say, I'm going to back him, Mr. Shankly. He said, what's wrong? He said, we can't buy the players. They won't go over I think it was £15,000 was the limit they'd go for a player. Ian St. John was going to be £35,000. Uh, Ron Yeats was going to be over £20,000. Mm -hmm. And the board were saying, we can't afford them. It's only teams like Everton who can afford them. They were known as Everton players. You know, so it just shows you how the history has changed. Eric Sawyer came in and said, leave it to me. And he said, I'm at board meetings, uh, they'd say, Mr. Shankly, what you say? Oh, I want to buy Ian St. John and Ron Yeats, and uh, oh, we can't afford them. They're Everton players, you know, Everton. Yeah, and then Eric Sawyer uh, sits up and say, you know, we should be buying these. If Mr. Shankly wants to buy them, he said, we can't afford not to buy them. And he, Shankly always says the best signing there ever was was Eric Sawyer because he opened the gates, he opened everything before. Um, so Ian St. John and Ron Yeats joining the club transformed the club completely from being nearly men to nearly getting promoted to winning the, winning the second division and then within two years 
winning uh, the first division, 63-64. Mm-hmm. It was very much like Klopp. Klopp mm-hmm. built, has built his team and the spine, Allison and Van Dijk, with the missing ingredients. Uh, Ron Yates was the tower in centre-half, mm-hmm. uh, dominating centre-half. He put Tommy Lawrence in goal, St. John, so he had the spine of the team. And it was built around that team. And, and Shankly, not only was he a brilliant manager, he was a brilliant man. And his philosophy on the game, his philosophy on life, mm-hmm. was the philosophy, you know, you'd be you'd warm to, you know. If he'd, if he'd become a politician, he would have swept to power, you know. He was like, he was unbelievable. And as kids, I was brought up a Roman Catholic, you know. So everything up to the years to the age of seven, you know, it was all Jesus this, Jesus that in school. But as soon as I got to seven, and I did my first Holy Communion, my first confession, and nothing seemed di- it didn't change me. At a, you know, not I didn't feel different. It was Shankly who was my inspiration, you know. Mm-hmm. And we used to hang on his every word, you know. And Shankly was a, you know, there was a song the copy thing. Uh, Shankly is our king, you know, and when he left, he'll always be our king, you know. Shankly was the, um, he was the reason for Liverpool being the club they are today. There's absolutely no doubt about that. You know, we mentioned yesterday with Karen, it seemed like, um, you know, her grandfather, he needed the people of Liverpool as much as the people of Liverpool really needed him. And it had, you know, it was a two-way relationship there. It wasn't this, I'm this person and you're subservient to me. It's, it was more of, I need you to, to yeah. be a part of this thing. And I think that really yeah. transcends now into how Klopp is also coming to yeah, the city. Yeah, definitely. I think one of Shankly's statements was, uh, I was made for Liverpool mm-hmm. and Liverpool was made for me. It was, it was the communion of those two things. And really, um, I did, I'm not sure it would have worked in other clubs. I'm not sure it would have worked to Huddersfield where he was. If if the board of directors had agreed to buy St. John and, um, and Yates, because uh, you already had Dennis Law at Huddersfield. They already had Ray Wilson, who was playing for Everton and became an England left-back. So we had this, the makings of a good team, but the, I don't think the crowd was the same. You know, at Liverpool it was the swing in the 60s. It was like a perfect storm. You know, the, you've seen those famous shots of the cops swaying. And singing yeah, She Loves You and, mm-hmm. and uh, Bear, Bear Bacharach songs, uh, you know, Anyone Who Had a Heart and that, you know, which was covered by Silla Black. And you can see the cop and it was like, it was meant to be. It was meant to be. It was, the, it was like Shankly had that confidence, he had that charisma, he had that enthusiasm. And so did the cop. And he, I think he commented that in the past he'd seen the crowd. And he'd be sitting on the dugout as an opposing manager and see the crowds to the right of the cop. And he said, they just need hope. You give them hope and it'll explode. And that's what happened. Yeah. I wanted to transition. I, I know um, the spirit of Shankly, you're, you're, that's something that you're, you're a committee member of or on the yeah. committee board. And um, I recall it, it started back in 2008 and really as a... Um, as a direct result of how Hicks and Gillette were running the team yeah. at the time, right? And yeah. so I wanted to ask you a question about when Hicks and Gillette left, did, was there this thought process of, do we keep this group going because we have some new American owners, now we need to make sure that they don't screw it up or let's transition to just being a part of uh, doing some of the charity work that, that they're doing now? Yeah, I think a bit of both really, I think. Um, there been so many people on the committee of the SOS and, and uh, the camaraderie was so great that we thought, well, you know, we need to carry on because obviously FSG are different type of owners to mm-hmm. Hicks and Gillette. Uh, but we thought, we, you know, we had to still be um, um, critical friends almost, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they've got, they've got a lot of things wrong in the past, FSG, you know, we've been there to say we don't agree with this, you know. So I think yeah. it was important that once we had the respect of of uh, the hierarchy of the club, whoever they were, that we should carry on to be uh, the voice of the supporters who were on here, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what we've tried to do. Um, 
The first thing that John Henry did, he got members of the committee, uh, Spilter Shankar together, and he said, without you, without you as an organisation, we wouldn't be here now. He never says it in public, right. but he said it to the committee, you know. And I can understand what he's saying there, but I think it was a, it was a joint collective effort. Mm -hmm. So we were on the ground in Liverpool, but things like when Hicks was going to um, banks in, in Wall Street trying to get more loans to carry on the ownership, when that was happening, there were people in, in America spotting them, taking the folks they got for money, and it just spread like wildfire over the internet, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, it was, a, it was a joint uh, effort from all Liverpool fans around the world. We might have been on the streets with the placards, but there were other people on the internet uh, doing brilliant work. And whoever spotted Hicks going into uh, the bank on Wall Street mm -hmm. and exposing them, that was the end. Mm -hmm. I think that was the beginning of the end because they realised that the power of football supporters is you boycotted the Sun newspaper mm -hmm. for, you know, for years and years since Hillsborough, 89. So it's a good lot, it's a, it's a good threat almost. You don't only get your bank boycotted by Liverpool fans around the world, it's gonna affect your business, isn't it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's where sometimes you think with everyone around the world on the internet thinking, oh no, some of their opinions are crazy, you know, on, even on clock now, why aren't we buying this, why aren't we buying that? Mm -hmm. But sometimes that is an advantage as well. I think the idea was also that, you know, um, Hicks and Gillette promised a lot and delivered nothing. Mm -hmm. FSG didn't promise much, really. They just said they'd run it better. Uh, but we'd had, uh, we were in, we were in um, discussions with journalists from the Boston Globe mm -hmm. who came over a few times to interview members of the SOS. And they were saying, you know, uh, well, what they'll do is they'll try this, they'll try tiered pricing at the match. Different, you know, if you're in the middle, uh, halfway line, it'll be more expensive than the side. You know, that'll never work. You can't do that at Anfield, you know. But that's what they did do, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the ticket prices, the £77, pound come, you know, the, there's certain things that have happened, the furlough and the staff mm -hmm. recently in, uh, during the lockdown. So there's certain things where the threat of the SOS has still been uh, very positive, really, you know. Yeah. And I think uh, the idea is never to get too close to the corridors of power in the club, but mm -hmm. to be uh, someone who they can even they can even say, "What do you think of this?" Before we put it out, what do you you know? So it, we are acting like almost like uh, a fans forum. Yeah. Uh, now there's certain things that go on that um, the club would never admit to, but mm -hmm. of course. Um, you know there's. There's lots of battles behind the scenes and they never come to fruition, some of them. They never come out to be public because the club have dropped the idea because we said that won't work, how do you have people on the streets again, you know? Yeah, it seems like for, for us out here that are not in Liverpool or are not part of the, the leadership of the SOS is that we just see the, the things that are reactionary from FSG that they have to go back. Yeah. on like like the furloughs like the uh the ticket scheme you know a few years yeah. back yeah, yeah and so we're always thinking that maybe you know we'd like to see sos become a an actual part of the decision making process but you're kind of giving us some insight that you are or that group is being um talked to on on many things that we just don't get to hear about here yeah i think on a regular basis yeah and i think okay. you know it's, you've got to be careful because you can't be seen to be you know you're in discussions with the club but you can't be seen to be, you know, uh, you know, in the corridors of power and being. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think any of the SOS would be like that because Karen Gill, you know, she's a, a president, you know, and, yeah. and the people on the committee, you know, were fairly, you know, the trustworthy people, you know, and mm -hmm. um, they're incorruptible. I'd say, you know, I think yeah. I don't think they could be corrupted because they 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 they. Their really interest is, is the football club, not finances. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you had an interview with the Mercy Sider where you mentioned when FSG took over that they're really, you know, they're 
mostly concerned about making money for themselves and then selling it on. Has any of your personal attitudes towards the group changed over these 10 years that they've had the club? Um, I mean, we all know there's still a hedge fund. Mm -hmm. They're there to maximize the profits and that. But, you know, I think, I think they've listened a lot more than mm -hmm. Hicks and Gillette, you know. And yeah. I think Hicks and Gillette, uh, even though I was vehemently opposed to them, I think the financial crisis, you know, the financial crash, really affected them, didn't it? You know, and um, they couldn't borrow any more money, but the fact that they'd said that they weren't going to do that, mm -hmm. like um, like the Glazers had done at Man United, yeah. meant that, you know, we can't believe a word they say, you know, and they were arguing amongst themselves, and it was a really confusing period, and Benitez was, you know, Benitez was um, in a situation where he was saying, I'm not getting any of the, any of the money through, and it was all it was all very very distasteful really you know but mm -hmm. i think the idea of uh, I, it's be careful what you wish for i think you know i think people are saying and john that period i wish dubai had a ball mm -hmm. but i don't you know i don't want uh, a middle eastern consortium to buy no. the, i don't want I, that i don't either yeah i've always i'm on record for saying that as well yeah, I, I, I i don't want to sell my soul to win no. something you know, we're not arms dealers, you know, we're not, we're a football club, you know, we don't, so, you know, a lot, Newcastle, recently I did an interview with the Newcastle fanzine and they were saying, you know, uh, oh, it still could be on, and I said, well, you know, do you really want that? Saudi Arabia, you know, it's human rights, and oh, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they would dismiss that and say, oh, well, you know, everything you do, if you go to the shops, you know, you, but the, the degrees and levels of, uh, of conformity, isn't it? And there's degrees and levels of, you know, I would not personally like to be backed by a consortium uh, mm -hmm. from the from the Middle East. You know what? Um, Peter, uh, quickly before before we go, um, definitely have to mention uh, your executive producer on uh, Shankly Nature's Fire. Oh, yeah. yeah, how how did that come about? Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a uh, that was. Um, yeah, how did that come about? I think somebody got in touch with uh, Hurricane Films. Hurricane Films have, uh, is started by our drummer in the farm, you know, and it's been a fairly successful uh, film company, you know. Uh, I think one of the lads who used to work at Hurricane Films went on to this other film company called River Horse, and River Horse had done um, a brilliant film on Joe Frazier. Absolutely fantastic film, you know. Um, and they wanted to do some on something on Shankly that they thought hadn't Shankly hadn't been covered properly by uh, by a documentary. There'd been sports documentaries, mm -hmm. but they wanted to cover more of his 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 attitude and his philosophy and his and his his, uh, his thoughts really, you know. And um, so they contacted Hurricane Films. Said, Who do you recommend? And they said, well. Peter's just done this book called When Football is Football. So we researched Shankly quite a bit, you know. Uh, and so that was the recommendation. So unfortunately though, the, um, we did a lot of filming over it. They had a small budget, $10,000 or whatever. That's all they had to make a part, you know, like a bit of a pilot, thinking that film companies would come in or uh, BBC would buy it or someone would buy it. And no one would come in. So it was literally on the shelf. For 18 months, you know, no one was really interested in uh, developing it, but uh, he kept on persisting. Um, the director kept on persisting, you know, and he, he kept on writing to people saying, you know, he's an independent film company and they're not getting much help off people. And in the end, someone from BBC Scotland answered them and said, uh, we like the idea of it and we're willing to give you a budget, the money. And they needed the money really for... Um, clips of Shankly speaking and also photographs of Shankly. That was the biggest uh, cost because all the interviews have been done most. They've done that on a wing and a prayer, really. Mm -hmm. you know, we got interviews in, we got match day footage and um, interviews with various players, but we haven't got uh, the photographs or the archive footage. Uh, and obviously, um, some of the footage is owned by Getty and people, and it costs an absolute fortune, you know. So uh, they got the 
they got the um, basically the funding of BBC Scotland, and so it was only ever going to be shown in Scotland. You know, it did get shown in Scotland, and the viewer ratings were massive. So that's why BBC in England uh, used it as well. It had a um, we showed it at the Philharmonic Hall for its premiere, and that was great because some of the old team came. Sadly, people like um, Tommy Lawrence was there, who's passed away, and Tommy Smith passed away. So a few of the old players, and it was the last time they really got together, you know, to see it. Uh, and I think it's, it, you know, it's, I think it's, uh, I'm proud of the documentary, you know. I don't think it's glitzy. I think it's, it's an honest uh, portrayal of what Shankly was, you know, and what he, uh, what he meant to people. And some people are saying, oh, there's not enough of Shankly in it speaking, but we've heard all those quotes before. We wanted other people's impressions and what, you know, so that's why it was, you know, that's why I think it had to be uh, the impression people had of Shankly and what he'd done. And Roger Hunt, Roger Hunt never does interviews. We got Roger Hunt to do an interview. Keegan never does interviews on Shankly and got Keegan to do it. So you, and we got, Jamie Carragher to do something and I asked Jamie if he'd asked Steve and Gerard to do it and he said yeah I'll do it. Uh, so we got all people who he wouldn't usually expect to get something for an independent low budget uh, production because when you see these other productions well when Kenny, uh, Kenny Daglish is one or Steve you know you're talking about millions of dollars for that production this was a you know this started off with 10,000 budget, you know, and they got money. I think they got $120,000 to buy the archive stuff. But that was it, basically, you know. And uh, I mean, I did the research and I, I tried to get as many interviews as I could, you know. And it's just great the way Keegan talks about him and the way Roger Hunt talks about him and St. John. And you can see the emotion, you know, and what he meant to these people, you know. Hey, um, Peter, through, you know, all your research and being a fan and living there, do you have a favorite player of all time that when, if, if someone says, hey, who's, who is the man for you for Liverpool history uh, as a player? Uh, uh, it's a hard one, that, because, you know, it's a hard, it's a really hard one. But I would have said up until recently, uh, I would have said John Barnes. Everyone mm -hmm. picked Kenny Daglish, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not doing it just to be contrary. But Kenny Daglish was a very British type of footballer. Mm -hmm. You know, he played for Celtic. He was a immaculate player. He had intuition, he knew everything, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think he could have played in a Brazil team. Mm -hmm. I don't think he could have played for Argentina or whatever. He was a very, you know, he fitted Liverpool mm -hmm. perfectly. Mm -hmm. But when I saw John Barnes, when he first came to Anfield, he did things with the ball that we'd never seen before. He did things with football that he'd never seen before. He literally walked towards fullbacks, walked towards them, didn't sprint towards them, just walked towards them and went past them. And it was Brazilian football at its best. You know, he would have walked into any uh, any team from any year, I think. You know, I think he yeah. was absolutely fantastic. So if you were to ask me before this current team, I would have said Barnes. Now, I would say Virgil van Dijk. Mm -hmm. Virgil van Dijk is the ultimate footballer, I think. He's, um, now, a lot, a lot of people say, you can't say Virgil van Dijk. He's only won the European Cup. <laughs> <Europe, laughs> I mean, but I can say Virgil van Dijk. I've seen all these players. Yeah. And I've seen van Dijk now for two years. And he's the best, one of the best players I've ever seen. He's certainly the best centre-half Liverpool I've ever had. And put him alongside Alan Hansen, and no one's no one's scoring, are they? No. You know, I'd say Virgil Van Dijk. The, the time he's got on the ball, he makes everything look so easy, so nonsense. But our current um, team is based around him as the pivot. Everything's based. Take Virgil Van Dijk off that team, and it's like Samson getting his hair cut. Yeah, there's no way near as strong, you know. You know, people don't realize that, like, last season, he had the most touches out of all our players, you know. You, yeah. So it just shows you the importance that he's just not the defender, it, that he it, a lot of stuff runs through his side, you know, and he's picking up passes and distributing. Yeah. So. And it's unusual um, 
to pick, you know, a player because I've seen the team since the seventies, mm-hmm. so I've seen all the greats and that. But you know, me me top three would be you know Barnes, Daglish, and uh, and Virgil Van Dijk. Mm-hmm. And people say, oh, you can't, you know, he's got to win more. So, <laughs> but I, I no, I'm go. I said to my dad. Now my dad's been going to Anfield. So, you know, as a season ticket holder since the early 60s, mm-hmm. and he went in the 50s playing at the gate, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, Who's the best player you've ever seen? And he said, Oh, it's a hard one. But in the end, he came out with Virgil van Dijk. I said, mm-hmm. Is he the best centre half you've ever seen? Yeah, undoubtedly. Because he's an amalgamation of Ron Heats, of Alan Hansen, of Lawrence, and, you know, uh, players like that. You know, mm-hmm. he's an amalgamation, he's, he's heavy, you know. Yeah. And you just know Virgil van Dijk could play a front for Liverpool. Mm-hmm. And be a massive success, you know. So it's not that he's compartmentalised to one thing. I'm a centre half. He can play anyway on the pitch. Anything. He's that yeah. good. You know, just, you know. I mean, he showed those skills when he played at Celtic. How he'd bring the ball out and, and yeah. score goals, right? So on this team, he doesn't have to do that. But yeah, I yeah I agree with you on everything you've said about him for yeah. sure. And I think I did uh, something for radio station recently. We get to name me be best eleven. Now, if you've asked me at the end of the season, um, you know, I would, I'd be saying, oh, not many, not many of the old team are getting the new team. Mm-hmm. They are the perfect team, you know. And right, that. Right. But significantly, when I did name me best 11, only Virgil van Dijk got in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tried to get Manny in it, but in the end, I went for uh, Fowler and Rush. Fowler, the most natural player I've ever seen. And Daglish mm-hmm. behind them, you know. So you can't really... I I'd, I'd would have loved to have got Manny in there. Barnes, as soon as was me holding midfield there, mm-hmm. Gerard on the right, and he'd have to play on the right because he'd be told to play on the right. <laughs> yeah. And Barnes on the left, you know. Then you got Dag Leash, Fowler and Rush, you know. And the back... The back... Uh, Clements was me goalie. Mm-hmm. Then it was Phil Neal. I, I love Trent, but I think Phil Neal... Mm-hmm. Most medals of any Liverpool player: Phil Neal, Van Dijk, Hansen, and Emma News. And nearly went for Robertson because I think Robertson's absolutely brilliant. But I think as a, as a player, Emma News transformed Liverpool Football Club. Yeah. So I think he's got to get in there. Isn't he? Well, uh, Peter, I know, I know uh, myself and Steve really appreciate you coming on. Um, and spending Pleasure. spending an hour or so. Um, I would love to have you back for part two because I want to talk about the Beatles legacy group and oh, I also yeah. want to talk about the casual doc- documentary oh, as well. Yeah. You know, as, yeah, as, an, I mean, as an Adidas fan, I've, I've got to hear like from you. So <laughs> I'd love to have you back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, fine, you know, sure. I mean, I love doing interviews. So yeah, if, if you can arrange that. I mean, the Beatles legacy, that's another thing. Um, you know, I as chair of the Beatles Legacy Group, uh, I want I want the narrative of the Beatles to to be more realistic, to be where they come from, which yeah. was which was R and B America. That's yeah, I, I had the pleasure of having lunch with Frida from, oh, um, really? la, la, last time I was in Liverpool, and that was actually really? just me, me, her, and her grandson having lunch, and it was uh, yeah, like, brilliant. I, you know, it's, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and Frida started to talk more. Mm-hmm. About a time with the, as the secretary of the fan club, and uh, yeah, well, she was Brian's Epstein's secretary, wasn't she, as well? Yeah. Uh, but you know, for me, uh, it's all about uh, where where did the Beatles come from? And obviously, mm-hmm. without uh, R&B, without black music in America, the Beatles mm-hmm. would not exist. Right. You know? I think it's important, and I'm going to try and stress that as much as I can. Also, if you look at uh, Mark Lewison's book, Tune In, which I've got a copy here, which is, I don't know if you have any mm-hmm. know about that, but that's regarded as the, that's, that's the abridged version, 800 pages, there's another one, 1800 pages, wow. and it only goes up to 1962, <laughs> his next one's coming out from 62 to 66, he thinks that might be out in 2025, <laughs> wow. but if you read that, you know, he traces the family histories of all the Beatles. And without uh, the great hunger, the Irish hunger um, of uh, the 1840s and 50s, the Beatles wouldn't, their ancestors wouldn't be in Liverpool. Because mm-hmm. three out of four 
had um, grandparents and great grandparents from Ireland. So you've got Irish, you got Irish influences, Celtic influences, um, you know, um, R and B, America, Black America. It's a melting pot, and without them, you wouldn't create the greatest group in the world. You know, I think that narrative has been lost a little bit. You know, boom, history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, again, I love it. I love history. So yeah, we love we love stories on this podcast. So uh, yeah, well, absolutely. one of the one of the books that I read when I was about seventeen, eighteen, which changed my life in many ways, was Betty My Heart It Wounded Me. Mm-hmm. Uh, D. Brown about uh, Native Americans. You know, I just it just changed. I wanted to read more and more, and became obsessed. Even when I was taught in America, you know. I always wanted to go to Dakota. We never got there. But no. I just wanted to go to uh, Stand and Rock, you know. Mm-hmm. And obviously, there's been disputes with Stand and Rock recently, hasn't there? So, you mm-hmm. know. There's been disputes about everything recently. So, yeah. We, yeah, <laughs> that'd yeah. Be, that's another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, we really appreciate your time, Peter. And, and okay. you know, and uh, just appreciate all the, all the stories and insights that you're being able to give. And, you know, we look forward to having another session with you soon. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And the one thing you can't dispute is Liverpool are champions of the world. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> nice one, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. All right, cheers, All right, Peter. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.